So at first, I believe that we shouldn't like make a little introduction. So today we're joined by Beam CTO, Alex Romanov, and he will talk a little bit on the development, on Beam, on his stance probably a little bit if he wants to, of course. And it will be great if you could introduce yourself a little bit too, what you find important. Sure, so uh, as you said, my name is Alex Romanov. Uh, I've been with Beam from the beginning, which was about uh, two, a little over two years ago. Um, before that, I was working in many different companies, mostly startup companies and dealing with many different products and technologies. So I have a quite uh, varied background uh, in software development. I have never been previously in any blockchain or crypto related project. So it's my first. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how it, uh, it was before Beam. Okay, cool. And actually, what was the thing that got you in the crypto space? So you said that you haven't been working with any blockchain projects before, and then you joined Beam, which is very, very known, and you've been there with very beginning. So what was the thing that got you interested, and did you find something particularly exciting in the crypto space? Yeah, so uh, an old friend of mine, uh, his name is Guy Korem. Uh, we worked together uh, a little over 10 years ago, and uh, we kept in touch. So I knew that he was heavily involved in all the... Uh, crypto space. He was uh, uh, dealing with all kinds of um, mining and then he developed his own mining company and uh, did a lot of things in crypto and he was very well known in Israel uh, in the space. So uh, we spoke sometime in the beginning of 2018 and I said uh, that I was looking for a new project at that time. And uh, he suggested to uh, do this project together to take uh, this Mimble Wimble protocol and build a new coin based on it. So there was like a lot of uh, uh, a lot of very interesting like requirements. He wanted it to be both scalable, confidential, and usable, and all these things. And I said, okay, listen, I don't know much about this space, but let's let's uh, let's work on it. Let's do it. And that's how it got started. Um, and we were very lucky to uh, get a great team of developers very quickly. Most of them are friends of mine that I've previously worked on on different projects. And so that's how the ball got rolling. And uh, back then, Beam was not known <laughs> at all. It was, didn't even exist. And uh, that's how it started back in March 2018. Seems like that eternity ago. Not, yeah, it seems like an eternity ago, but actually it's been like two years ago only. Right. And... Uh, how do your personal values, do you think, correlate with ones of Beam of privacy and scalability and like the crypto space decentralization and so on? Uh, could you please repeat that because I didn't hear the first part of the question? Oh, yeah, sure. How do you think your personal values uh, correlate with the ones of Beam about privacy and scalability and decentralization and everything of that? Well, um, I, I, so... When I started learning about this space and um, I, I saw how it works, how Bitcoin works, um, what people or what kinds of people are interested in these kinds of technologies. Uh, and basically, um, I saw that there are several different types of, of approaches to this entire space. So one of them is kind of this um, uh, ideological, let's say, about uh, how money should be created and managed in the world. Uh, people who kind of don't like the idea of uh, governments doing whatever they want with the money, printing or whatever. So this is like one more uh, politically or economical approach. Uh, there are also people that are interested in the technological uh, part of this process, the cryptography and, and all the other stuff. And um, um, of course, there are also traders and people who just want to you know, trade and uh, do more than just maybe uh, you know, send value from one point to another, like uh, people that are currently working on the DeFi space, and we'll talk about it later. And uh, uh, I always thought, and as a company, we also adopted this approach of practicality. Uh, and practical for us means that you can use crypto in wide variety of scenarios, both personally and as a business. And it was very natural for us that uh, confidentiality, as we call it, uh, anonymity or privacy, there are different words for that, but I like confidentiality the most because I think it uh, best uh, explains what we mean. It's important both for an individual because you do want to be in control which information is known about you and to whom. And obviously it's very important for businesses because the last thing you want is for your competitors uh, or uh, other companies to know 
who are your clients, who are your suppliers, wh what kind of money you pay and stuff like that. That's how the commerce works today. On the other hand, uh, it is also important for you to be able to disclose uh, the information that you want to disclose to either other people or authorities if you want to pay taxes and uh, you have to do some kind of uh, auditing and uh, uh, you know produce reports and uh, all that stuff. You want to be a legitimate business. It's also very important for you to have this ability as well, which is why what we did, we basically took uh, this uh, idea of confidential cryptocurrency and there were already several like these, like Zcash and Monero, they were already well known in the space. But what we have added is this uh, idea of practicality. So we gave you the, not just the ability to send your transactions privately, but also the control of on, on which information you would like to disclose without compromising the other participants in the network. So that was the, the idea. And that's how we came with this concept of auditability. And from the very beginning, it was very important for us to underline and stress this fact that we're not just confidential cryptocurrency, we're also auditable and practical and usable. And uh, we believe that this combination of factors uh, will actually lead to wide adoption of, of Beam uh, for both private and business use. Yeah, Beam has been going really great. Uh, I have been myself working in a cryptocurrency wallet before and I still am the CMO of Guarda Wallet probably. We, we even, I think, talked some time ago. and. Uh, what are actually the pros and the cons of Mimblewimble as a protocol? Because from the point of services, uh, it can be pretty challenging to adopt it and pretty challenging to like, get it on board. Talking from the wallet perspective, at least now we have it on SwapZone, but it's totally different. We work through partners, but actually integrating Mimblewimble can be pretty hard. And so what do you think could be the way to make it like more out there and more adopted? Yeah, so um, Mimblewimble is actually a very, very interesting uh, thing. So first of all, it's a protocol that was anonymously published um, about, uh, I think, something around July or August 2016. And um, uh, from the beginning, it attracted a lot of attention because it uh, solved two of the issues that were kind of uh, standing against each other. Um, the confidentiality and the combination with scalability in terms of the blockchain size. So in most cryptocurrencies before that, like Zcash and Monero, uh, the addition of confidentiality meant adding more information onto the blockchain, which as a result made the blockchain heavier, more megabytes of, or, or even gigabytes of data needed to be downloaded for it by a new node before it could participate in the network. And the Mimblewimble idea was to restructure uh, the transaction in a way that not only you could achieve the same uh, good confidentiality without actually increasing the blockchain size. On the contrary, you could actually make the blockchain smaller by combining the blocks together and then getting rid of all the intermediate transactions so that if I send something to, like, uh, to another person, B, and he sends it to C and, and so on, we can just remove all the intermediate transactions and remain only with the origin of the coin, which is the block where it was mined, and the current state of the coin, which is basically who it belongs to, and all the information in between uh, could be removed from the blockchain without sacrificing the uh, integrity. So that was the original idea, which was very interesting, and immediately there was a lot of uh, research on it. Uh, Andrew Poestra did a lot of work uh, and published a paper about Mimblewimble uh, Green, uh, was the project who started implementing it back in November 2016. So there was quite a lot of uh, talk about it. But as we found out, it's, it's actually much more than that because uh, even though it's a relatively simple protocol, so the white paper, the original white paper is only four pages long. It basically it describes the idea of creating the transaction in a specific way, uh, but it can be extended into many different directions. And we used a lot of these features in uh, our development and I will give a few examples of how we extended Wimblewimble and what we've done with it. So that was the, the, the basic idea. So the doubt, well, the, not doubt, but uh, some major difference of Wimble from let's say Bitcoin or other known cryptocurrencies at the time was that it was a uh, interactive protocol. So it required both the sender and the receiver to participate actively in the creation of the transaction. And it was the major challenge because most of the wallets uh, as you're probably familiar with, uh, they, they were built on an idea that I can just create a transaction, sign it myself and send it to the network and then forget about it. And I did not, I didn't need to know anything about 
uh, the receiver of the other side of the transaction. So we needed to overcome this, this uh, problem. And uh, we did several things. First of all, was uh, a creation of an SBBS. SBBS is basically a very simple decentralized uh, encrypted messaging system that allows wireless to send messages to one another in an encrypted way. And this way, you don't have to be uh, online at the same time. You just can send a message and then wait for the other wallet to come online sometime in the future, let's say within 12 hours or something like that. Depending, like we can configure it differently, but we chose some parameters uh, to make it optimal both for the network and the users. And then the receiver wallet sends the message back and the sender wallet picks it up and finishes the transaction and sends it to the network. So that was the first thing we did. And we have integrated this into our wallets, uh, which we invested a lot of time in designing and building. And um, uh, the overall user experience was very uh, smooth. So it's basically uh, also due to the fact that in Beam blocks are created once a minute, so the transactions uh, are very, very quick. Okay, so you click send, and uh, if the other side is online, it's almost immediate. Uh, and if it's not, it just uh, automatically your wallet handles the incoming messages and completes the transaction. So it was very nice, and that was the first uh, like iteration of this of this approach. And it's okay for most use cases because uh, if you want to send someone some some funds, you have like two options: either the wallet is online all the time, like it is on exchanges or pools or uh, stores that accept Beam today. And then it's like instant. Or if the other side is not online, you just say, listen, I'm sending you some beams via Telegram. Uh, give me an address. And then uh, th that's how it works today. So that was the first step. Uh, however, it was not, um, it, it, it was very nice. And um, uh, it, it worked well. It took people some time to get uh, used to this idea of interactivity. Uh, but we wanted to do uh, even more than that because Today, if you want to receive Beam, somebody has to tell you about it using some kind of uh, messenger or some kind of external channel. So in order to make this even more flexible in the future, we have developed uh, a wallet service, which is a web service. Uh, it's centralized in terms that it's run on a specific server, but it's trustless. So it doesn't know any secrets of yours and cannot control your points. But what it can do, it can receive and decrypt your SBBS messages, which makes it possible for you, for example, to get notifications on your mobile wallet uh, or your desktop wallet or your web wallet if you are in, in the browser. And this is something that we are currently uh, finishing and testing and rolling in the next, uh, uh, I believe, months or so. So it's a, it's a new thing. That's like the one, one addition that we did to improve this interactivity component. Another thing that we did very recently, actually, in the last version that was released uh, on June 28th, it was also the fourth version. I will talk about it later. Uh, we added an ability to do one-side payments that work just like you are used to in Bitcoin. Oh, so without any um, having to confirm exactly. and... Yeah. So, and the way it works is that uh, one of the things we have, we have added, um, you probably maybe have a question about that, which is Lilantus. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Lelantus, amongst other things, it allows us to have these one-side payments that you can just get some bulk of information from the receiver once uh, and then send the uh, multiple payments using these one-side transactions. That's oh, okay. It's, it, it's actually much more it, what people are much more used to. So this kind of brings yeah. Wimble Wimble and Mass and allows to kind of easier management. So I believe that from this point, probably this development that you have just described is the most major things in the roadmap because I was going to ask about like what are the main goals for being for No, for being actually right no. <laughs> no, okay. One of the problems when, when you uh, start talking about BIM in a one hour interview is that there, there are so many things going on at the same time. It's very, but no, uh, it's not the, the most major thing. The most major thing is the DeFi platform that we're building, but I will talk about it later. So, uh, okay, DeFi is very interesting, so we should definitely talk about it a little bit later. You also mentioned Green, which is another coin based on Mimblewimble. So what are actually the differences between these two coins? Because I haven't been seeing a lot of news on Green lately, but uh, it seems to be developing too. So what, what are the kind of like things that set Beam and Green, green apart? Yeah, so when we started, um 
working. Uh, for the first six months, uh, we were closed source because we wanted to get going, get uh, hired developers, start developing. So we were not open source until the first testnet, which came six months after we started. Uh, we actually uh, released the mainnet only nine and a half months after we started development, which was very fast. And uh, during that time, when people uh, heard about Beam and being another Mimble Wimble project, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the usual talk of us being a scam and being this and that. And of course, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, admiration for Green initially. And uh, we also uh, always liked uh, this project and we kind of, we talk uh, with Green team members and we exchange ideas sometimes. We have common channels that we participate at. So yeah, um, Green is actually much more different from Beam uh, than, than people tend to like believe or know uh, because other than the common commonality of the same protocol, Mimble Wimble, all the other things are basically different. Uh, starting with the technology stack, but also the emission. Uh, Beam has a capped emission like Bitcoin with periodic halving. Uh, green has unlimited emission with 60 greens being printed every block for eternity. And uh, also, of course, the mining algorithms are different. Um, the idea is different. Uh, green is meant to be means of exchange. Beam is more playing in this Bitcoin kind of uh, store of value space. So basically, almost everything else outside of the Mimble Wimble world is different between us. Uh, one of the most important differences was how uh, the projects were managed and funded. So Green is a completely uh, community-based project. So they have donations that they receive and they have the Green Council, which uh, determines how to distribute this money and the uh, uh, developers submit their proposals for the features that they would like to, to develop. And then kind of the community with the council decides how to uh, fund these specific features. In Beam, we took a different approaches. Uh, we, we took um, a part of a mining reward, namely 20% of the mining reward for the first five years. And we called it the treasury. So every time a new block is mined, uh, today it's like 50 beams uh, per block after the first halving that we had in the beginning of the year. So 40 goes to the miner and 10 beams go to this treasury uh, allocation. And within this treasury, there are three parts. Part goes to the investors. We have uh, uh, external investors, which are, uh, it's not an ICO. Because first of all, only the professional uh, accredited investors could participate. That's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, we didn't get this ICO like, you know, big bag of money at once. Uh, this entire process is uh, over five years. So every month there is a part of the treasury which matches this 60 months period uh, is made available to everyone involved. And uh, this creates much smoother alignment of interest over time. So unlike ICO, where you just have all this money and then you basically don't need to do anything. You can just go to the Maldives and you know spend it all. Uh, here we're all interested, uh, both the investors, the team, which gets another part of the treasury and the foundation, which I will talk about in a minute, uh, get uh, this money over five years. So we're all interested in longer term success of the project, obviously. And of course, the idea is that we, uh, over time, we will become more and more decentralized. And uh, even like today, we're in a completely different uh, place than when we started. So we basically started as a company, which was very different from Green. And this allowed us two things. First of all, it allowed us to um, recruit uh, paid professional developers, do things much quicker, have more uh, standard like structure with like CEO and CMO and CTO and all that. And uh, that, was the f uh, that was the framework that we used for the first uh, two years almost. And then in the beginning of 2020, we moved to the second part of the process, which was the Beam Foundation. So the company shut down and disintegrated. All the CTOs, MOs, and that disappeared. And uh, the foundation took over. This foundation is a nonprofit organization which has the part of the treasury that we allocated for it. Mm -hmm a large part, about 20%. And from now on, BIM is only financed by BIM. So the BIM price directly uh, influences uh, the runway and all the other considerations. And the BIM Foundation has an independent board of directors, which are not parts of the company. There's one representative of the original company, but all the others are uh, 
unpaid members of our community, each representing a different segment, uh, trading, mining, uh, and uh, etc. And uh, they govern the process, the, the strategic decisions going forward, what to develop, how to develop, and uh, this is something that uh, that was basically different from the beginning of 2020. So this is like about us and green and and the different things. So Beam is right now uh, Beam development is funded by Beam Price and like how it goes. And yeah. how does unlimited emission actually influence that? Are there any problems with that because there's no cap or? No, no, no. Our emission is limited. It's kept. Our emission is kept. Green oh, is unlimited. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got confused there. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, We're just like Bitcoin. We're just like Bitcoin in terms of like a, there is a halving every four years. Yeah. Except for the first year. So the first year we had a halving at the end of the year, which brought it from 100 beams per block to a 50. And the next one will be in uh, 2024. Okay, okay. So are you actually interested? Of course, you are interested in having more services, more projects, integrating Beam, working with Beam, like doing everything to kind of like get the ideas out there. And how, if confidentiality, I love this word, is the main uh, goal and the main kind of feature of the project, and what are the instruments that you use to kind of bring the ideas on, of privacy of co confidentiality out there and make other companies and individuals adopt them and understand them and spread them? A process that's going on on several levels. First of all, every feature that we develop, uh, the key consideration is to maintain the same level of confidentiality uh, that our users are used to. So, for example, when we introduce centralized trustless ser services or any other types of uh, tools that integrate with Beam today, and there, there are quite many, uh, our key consideration is to always make sure that the default behavior of these applications and these features within the wallets are always the most confidential, as confidential as possible. So we always think what be, uh, how, if, how to make life you know, as difficult as possible for the user to do things wrong in this regard. Uh, it's very important for us uh, because this, this is like one of the, the most important thing. Uh, it's not always simple. Sometimes there are uh, very difficult design choices. We could have made things a lot, of e a lot easier uh, in some cases for, for the usability of the product. Because as you know, in blockchain, the usability is very complex um, theme. And the uh, usability with confidentiality is even, uh, is even more difficult. I, I will give you one example. Uh, when you use these SBBS and you send addresses to one another, uh, it would be nice to have an address book. So for example, if we transact often, it would be much simpler for me to just look you up. Choose from the list, yeah. Like yeah, yeah, but uh, we have to do this very carefully because this information, first of all, should remain within wallet. It should not be sent out. Uh, the same for the comments. Like, for example, we added this comment section. When I create a transaction, I want to comment what was this money about, like who sent me what and why. And many people thought initially that it was kind of a chat message. Like, I would write something to you and send it uh, out. And uh, they would uh, call the support and uh, write, like, listen, wh why isn't it working? I'm writing a message and the other side doesn't see it. And we had to say, no, listen, this note is for you. Because we do not want any additional metadata to be out there of course, not in the blockchain, but also not in, in, in the SBBS as well. Um, so this is like one of these difficult things. Like you want address book, but you don't want to send too much metadata out. And uh, th this is something that we really, you know, make sure that doesn't happen. So th there is minimal information in the blockchain and minimal information on the network. Uh, that's like one thing that we always consider in terms of confidentiality. But the other aspect of that is uh, community work, let's say, and you know, making uh, awareness, because uh, there are two problems out there. First problem is that uh, privacy, and this is why I don't use the word privacy too often, privacy is very low determined, has a lot of connotations to a lot of different things and aspects. And uh, Sometimes uh, the conversation starts in one place and then gets to another because the same word is used in two different contexts, which is why I always try to say, listen, confidentiality is about which information you disclose, which information you choose to disclose. It's about that. It's not about other things. 
And the other problem is that uh, there is this sometimes, I don't know, misconception that privacy coins are only meant for, I don't know, uh, some kind of law violations or, or, or stuff like that. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of that. Yeah, and like, uh, if you are an honest person, you don't have anything to hide. And um, this misconception is basically uh, very popular. Uh, and, you know, you see it a lot in different places. And I always say, okay, the fact that you don't have something to hide doesn't mean that information about you cannot be used against you in some way. So, yeah, you don't, if you don't want to hide anything, just publish, you know, all your transactions to Twitter, it's okay, you, you can do it, but it's your choice. It has to be your choice. And if I don't want to do that, I should be able to choose that as well, because a lot of people get, got used to this Bitcoin structure where you have to kind of broadcast this information. And what, what we're trying to say, you don't have to. You can do it if you want, but we leave this choice to you and not to the system or to specific blockchain. Uh, and besides the community building, what is the third thing that's the key pillar of this like adoption? Yeah, so uh, we, we at first we thought that it's going to be a problem with regulation, but this didn't happen, at least not yet. Uh, so b basically there is this technological issue, there is this awareness issue, and uh, all the other things are basically related to practicality and convenience of use. That's, that's the three things in terms of confidentiality. So people do want confidentiality, but they don't want to sacrifice too much. Usually there, there is a perception that for, for privacy, for confidentiality, you need to sacrifice convenience at some point and just like be super careful with everything and like use super complex methods. But right now it's not exactly true. Like the world is moving somewhere towards the direction of privacy and confidentiality of transactions of finance, of data is becoming a little bit more simple, but also the world is just becoming more intrusive. So this is a little bit kind of like disbalanced yes. here. Yeah, so uh, in my personal opinion, it's a um, more of a sociological uh, problem because just like you're used to locking your door when you go out, I believe, uh, unless you live in a very, very safe place and you don't do that. Uh, oh, and true. Yeah, exactly. But uh, most people, uh, they don't think about it. You, they get out of the car, they lock the car. They get out of the door, they lock the door, and they rarely forget the keys, and it's like it's working. Uh, however, in the computer world, um, because of the complications of the technology and because of the lot of things that people are not actually aware of, it's much more difficult to make people lock their doors uh, in the virtual space, so to speak, uh, and I believe this process is a process of education. I think our children will, will be different from us in this regard. They will have a lot of um, these built-in social skills, let's say, technological social skills that uh, we didn't have ahead to learn. For them, this will be natural to put passwords on things, to encrypt things they don't want, not to send out information that they believe could be uh, used in a harm harmful way. Uh, and this is like what I tell my daughter when she uses uh, all these, uh, you know, gadgets and devices and TikToks and stuff. And uh, it's a long process. And in crypto space, even more so because you are the only owner of your money. It's your key, right? Your, your seed, your money. And uh, this is even more important because people are not used to this concept. People are used to somebody has some... Uh, responsibility. And uh, if something happens, they can call someone up and they will fix it for me. So in crypto space, if you do some mistake, it's on you. Uh, there is no, you can't call Bitcoin. You can, there, there is no one out there who will return you your transaction if you accidentally send it or restore your lost key or whatever. Uh, and what we're trying to do is we're constantly thinking on how to make this uh, product more usable and simpler and uh, guide uh, our users to the correct space where they have less um, possibility of a mistake. Yeah, so it's a constant struggle. I, I, it's, not, it's not a solved problem at all, but that's what we're trying to achieve. This is a very admirable goal because generally these questions of confidentiality, of privacy, of just security of data, they're right now, it's like it's 2020, it's corona everywhere, everybody's scared, but those are becoming way more important because there is like surveillance, there are data breaches, there are lots of this like 
very unpleasant things that one would like to avoid. So doing this in the crypto space where really you cannot call Bitcoin and say like, yo guys, can you please like revert my transaction and just send it in the wrong address? Like, oh my bad. Uh, it's, it's completely on the user and it's completely on the people who are involved into this. And so they should have some sort of facilitation. And actually, like, can you probably like, make a kind of prediction where will all this like privacy space and the crypto space and the unity of them will go in what what would the direction be in the future like you can pick any time period that you would like to make a prediction to i don't know a year five years doesn't matter uh yeah so one thing that i i think is for me one of the most exciting things about the crypto space is that this is it, this unique combination of Economics, politics, technology, sociology, like many different areas uh, came together because I think it's the first time in, in, in the recorded history that you can create decentralized money, like as a concept, first of all. And uh, regardless whether it's Bitcoin or, or, or Beam or whatever, it's not about that. It's like this concept is very new to us as a society and it's very different. Uh, and uh, once you... Uh, get to this point, this idea, uh, there is some change that is going to happen and the adoption might be slow, but you see, and you see this like today, uh, and I can give you examples that I think are the most uh, acute examples of this happening, how all sides, uh, whether it's in old economics and banks and governments or the new technological companies, they all shift constantly in, in the direction of, let's say, uh, it, it's kind of, it's not exactly adoption, but it's like mutual change. Both sides change a little bit over the years. And I think one of the best, best examples was the Libra. Uh, when Facebook announced the Libra, which was not even a public blockchain, it was this kind of federated uh, uh, group of organizations, uh, which all of them are old school players with a lot of money. And they have announced uh, the, this uh, intention to launch this um, project. Uh, and they said the word cryptocurrency. They didn't have to, by the way. They, they could have said payment platform. They could have said any other combination of words, like PayPal exists for years and no, no problem. But since they said cryptocurrency, you saw an immediate reaction from all the governments, both United States and Europe, said, wait a second. Like, they have like 2.7 billion users, so I don't know how much, and suddenly they will become the biggest economy in the world if they have their own money. Like, what was going to happen? And, and, and suddenly there was like a lot of, uh, pushback from, from the regulators and they said, no, don't do it. Uh, and, and they didn't eventually. But uh, I was amazed at the speed of this reaction because usually, you know, government's like, okay, Bitcoin, Schmidtcoin, there is something going on. Let's set up a committee. Uh, let's discuss this. There is this European body for regulating everything. And, you know, there is this crypto department in it. But this was like instant. Like, yeah, know, it was an instant fire. Like everybody was talking about it. It was such a mainstream thing. Like yeah. on the radio and the TV and the internet, like people, like my grandpa was telling me about Libra. I was like, what? Like, what? You don't even know Bitcoin. Exactly. Exactly. So that, that's basically, and, 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 like, we really wanted this project to happen because we said, great, finally, there will be widespread awareness and we, we, we could benefit from that. But no, it didn't happen because they suddenly realized that they don't know uh, how to live with all that. So, yeah, I think uh, what we saw from talking with a lot of different uh, parties over the years, both technological and political and regulators, uh, we saw that there is uh, a shift and uh, there is uh, this kind of evolution of, on both sides. So the old banking system uh, is slowly moving to digital money in some form, first of all. And uh, uh, on the other side, people don't want to give up their privacy so easily. And uh, um, you see now with all these... Um, news that almost anything can be used against you in terms of privacy like even the corona application that's tracking your contacts to make sure you avoid uh you know getting sick uh it becomes immediate issue like who controls this information and, and things like that so I, what i'm i think is going to happen is that going forward we will see this um kind of symbiotic change like both sides will change a little bit i don't know where exactly it will end up but I'm sure of two things. First of all, the idea of decentralized money is not going away as the idea. I don't know which project it will be or what kind of blockchain it will be eventually. 
And I think that privacy and confidentiality will be an integral part of any solution eventually, because otherwise you cannot, uh, you don't have this control, right? So everything is checks and balances, right? You have to, to have some kind of human rights that protect your, uh, your individual freedoms. And uh, this is like one of them, just like you cannot in most countries search just anyone, you know, or go get into their home or search their car. You have to have some kind of reason for that. At least the same is going to happen with money. So you, you have to have some kind of um, checks and balances on that. And that's what confidentiality does. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That does. Uh, we're kind of running out of time here. So I would probably like to uh, ask the last question, also the most like chill one. Uh, we would love, our team would love you to give some kind of advice for our users and for the readers and the viewers of this interview when it's out on their like cryptocurrency journey and on their own privacy journey. It can be pretty much anything, but what you find really crucial. For, uh, advice on what? On just like being in the cryptocurrency space and being careful about your privacy and like stuff like that. Okay. So we didn't talk about DeFi. If we have, oh, actually, we, have no, we, we didn't talk about DeFi, but I need that. I, I think that we'll need to have like a separate interview for that because we're running out of time for this one. But All right. I would love to talk about DeFi. Sure. So, uh, so let's get to the back to the advice. Um, I think that it depends on who you are. If you are a technological person, I think the technology behind the crypto projects is amazing. The cryptography, the decentralized systems, it's an amazing topic to get interested in. Uh, if you're a trader, obviously, there is a lot of different and interesting opportunities to make money. But most importantly, if you are a person who is um, interested in the future of mankind, uh, I think you can find a lot of interesting projects that really have true innovation in mind. And BIM is definitely one of them. Uh, and it's, it's like privacy is just one aspect, which is very interesting and very important, but there are many other aspects of decentralized computing in general, um, decentralized computation, you, like smart contracts or any other, like if you're in, into economics, you have a lot to, to contribute. Just find a project that is most close to your personal values. And I think anyone can contribute today to many very interesting projects that are running. Beam, of course, but there are many other others that are uh, doing a lot of interesting stuff whether it be just a community member or uh, ambassador or promoter or actually act actively helping by contributing anything, basically starting from fixing bugs or looking for bugs and uh, spreading the ideas. There's like a lot, a lot to do in this space for everyone. This is really great. I think that actually this like community union generally is very important in, in the crypto space because honestly, I have never felt this accepted in any place and in here, it's many, many people who are very different and they just gather to do something that suits them, that they find interesting, they contribute to the projects, like in some cases, absolutely for free, but just because they're interested. And this absolutely. is an amazing thing about the crypto space. So this absolutely. is super valuable. Our community is amazing. And uh, we were extremely surprised, like people who are used to work like on old school projects like, you know, companies doing something and suddenly you are out in the open, everything is in the open. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of positive feedback that we're receiving. And uh, you see that people are actually interested and talk a lot about it all over the world. Like we have regional communities in Africa and Asia and, uh, you know, all, all over the world. Very interesting, as you said, very different people, uh, but uh, definitely uh, gives you unbelievable uh, positive you know, energy and strength to, to continue and do this, uh, these things. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So I need to uh, ask you another thing, one, one very small thing. Sure. Can I have your promise that we'll have the second part of this interview to talk about DeFi? Because just we don't have time. <laughs> absolutely. Now. Absolutely. And anytime. Also we have great questions from our community members, actually, that we cannot squeeze in this one, too. So probably we can just kind of postpone them for the next one. And it would be great to chat with you again. It's super pleasant to have you here. We'll be uploading this interview soon to our YouTube and to the transcript to Medium, Publisher Weeks, and everywhere we can. And so the last words that was Alex Romanov of Beam. It was a pleasure talking to you. Again, my name is Marie Carolla, CEO of SwapZone. And 
Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. And uh, let's do it again next time.